All right. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar um, entitled CRISPR Solutions, How to Choose and Implement CRISPR in Your Research. Uh, my name is Laura Gerst, and I am a Senior Marketing Specialist here at GenScript. And um, so as you're well aware, um, the CRISPR technology has really been um, evolving at a very quick pace. And as this has been occurring, I mean, it's, been, it's become difficult to know which systems work best for your research. Um, and so in this webinar, what we wanted to do is kind of tell you a little bit about not only CRISPR, uh, but some of the um, advancements that there have been in the technology, and hopefully give you some clarity on how best you can use it in your lab. Um, so during the webinar, we'll go over some useful considerations. So hopefully this can help you uh, kickstart your CRISPR experiments. Um, and then we'll also provide you with some tips, um, tricks, or recommendations to help you get the most out of this technology. Um, so if you have any questions during the presentation, um, you can submit them by typing them into the questions field that you see on your screen. Um, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them after the webinar. Um, frequently asked questions along with their answers, as well as the webinar itself, will be posted on our website at www.genscript.com. And then finally, at the end of the presentation, you'll receive a brief survey. We encourage you to fill this out, as it's going to help us better design and optimize our services in future webinars um, to meet your needs um, in the near future. So let's go ahead and get started. So today I'm going to go over um, a few different topics relating to CRISPR. Um, the first topic that I'll go over is a CRISPR background. So for those who are still getting used to CRISPR, still learning about what it's like, um, we'll go over that first. Second, I'm going to talk a bit about um, how to use CRISPR reagents effectively. Um, there are a variety of different options, so kind of knowing which ones are best for you can be a little confusing. Um, so we're going to spend a bit of time uh, talking about that. And the third part of the talk, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, how you can use CRISPR libraries for high throughput screening. Um, this is a really um, very useful uh, technology that's been developed using the CRISPR system. Um, and so that might be help for, helpful to you as well. And then finally, um, we'll wrap up by discussing um, how CRISPR has been optimized for editing of mammalian cell lines. So to begin, um, what is CRISPR? So the word CRISPR refers to clustered, regularly interspaced palindromic repeats. Um, and it orig originates from the adaptive immune system in bacteria. Um, so CRISPR-based immunity is composed of two main phases. Um, there's, uh, in the first phase, or during immunization, um, Cas proteins, specifically Cas1 and Cas2, um, form a complex that cleaves foreign viral DNA as it enters the cell. Um, and this, after it's been cleaved, then the foreign DNA is then incorporated into um, the bacterial CRISPR loci as repeat spacer units that you see here. And then second, in the, once um, the bacterial cell has been reinfected by a bacteriophage, um, the repeat spacer units are transcribed to form a pre-CRISPR RNA um, complex. And this complex um, can basically help guide, um, basically helps guide the uh, Cas9 proteins to the viral DNA and at which point the viral DNA is cleaved, and then it can no longer reinfect the cell. So again, it's, um, this has become an essential component to bacterial immunity in terms of self-protection from for, uh, incorporation of foreign DNA. Um, so as you're aware, um, upon uh, recognition of the system in bacterial cells, it has since been adapted for um, gene editing in eukaryotes. And for this process to occur, there are three essential components. The first essential component is the Cas9 endonuclease. Um, so this is the enzyme that actually creates a double strand break or single strand break um, into the gene. And it's been further functionalized um, using 
um, nuclear localization uh, sequences so that it can work best in um, eukaryotes. Um, the second uh, major component is the guide RNA. So this, um, this guide RNA actually is what gives directionality to the Cas9 enzyme. So this tells the Cas9 enzyme where to go. And it will target a very specific sequence or its complementarity to a specific target sequence um, that you're interested in. It is composed of two components. One is a CRISPR RNA sequence, or CRRNA. So this is about a 20 nucleotide sequence. Again, it's complementary to your target. And then there's also a tracer RNA. And so you often see this depicted as it's a hairpin loop structure. Um, and this is what helps guide Cas9 um, to, to the uh, target sequence as well. And then the third major component, if this is if you're doing any knock-in, is you need a donor DNA template. Um, so this can be in two, one of two forms. So typically you can deliver it as a plasma DNA, or you can deliver it as an oligo. So two, uh, two different options. Um, but the major two co two components that you'll need, at least for knockout, will be your uh, at your enzyme, your Cas9, and then your guide RNA. So the question is, so how does the system really work? Um, so the guide RNA, again, is designed to target a 20 nucleotide region in the genomic, um, in the genomic DNA. And it has to recognize, in order for it to work, there needs to be a specific, what we call, protospacer sequence. So here we have it in red. Um, it's typically around, um, the size varies depending on the Cas9 enzyme, but for wild type, it's a three nucleotide long sweet sequence. And essentially, the Cas9 enzyme looks for this PAM sequence, and then at the, which point the guide RNA can um, bind complement, will become complementary to the target, and that's how you get very targeted editing. Um, and then once it's recognized the target sequence, um, you'll create a double strand break about three to four nucleotides upstream of this PAM. So after the double strand break has been created, there are two ways that um, the break can be repaired. The first or most common method is through if there is no donor DNA present, or if you don't have, if you're basically just doing a knock-in, then the double strand break will be repaired through non-homologous end joining, in which case you'll get an insertion or deletion, or in other words, an indel, and then you'll create a knockout. Alternatively, if you want to do knock-in and you have a donor DNA um, sequence present, then the break will be repaired through homology-directed repair. And essentially, you'll get a precise alteration or correction, and then you'll get a functional knock-in. So can two different ways to repair depending on whether or not you have a donor DNA sequence available. OK, so now that I've covered a little bit of background on the CRISPR system, I just wanted to go over some of its advantages, especially over some, some of the more popular um, recombination methods. Um, so here I have three, probably right now, the three most common methods for the uh, creation of uh, let's see, double strand breaks or recombinants. Um, the first here is zinc finger nucleases. Um, so zinc finger nucleases can uh, consist of zinc finger DNA binding motifs and a beta-beta-alpha uh, configuration. And they recognize three base pair segments in the DNA. Um, and the system also includes um, a nuclease, which will target and cut the segment at a very specific location. Um, you probably have also heard of uh, talons. Um, this is another um, common editing technique. It stands for transcription activator-like um, effector nucleases. Um, again, this is a protein-based system um, that is designed um, to contain uh, DNA binding domains that recognize specific DNA sequences down to the base pair. The nucleus component will also target and cleave these DNA sequences as zinc finger nucleases do. And then finally, um, we already mentioned now the Cas CRISPR Cas system, which employs the 20 nucleotide CRISPR DNA, uh, RNA um, fused to a tracer RNA and Cas9 endonuclease. And this recognizes specific sequences down to the base pair. So one of the really clear 
um, advantages of the CRISPR system over zinc fingers and talons is that it is an RNA, DNA-based system as opposed to um, a protein DNA-based system. So for instance, for zinc fingers and talons, and maybe you've already done this in your lab, but for each sequence you want to edit, you need to engineer a protein specific to that gene. So this can take a lot of time, this can cost a lot of money, and you need to have a protein engineering experience. So it's, it's, it's effective, but it's, it is, um, there are a lot of challenges associated with it. And it also has relatively low efficiency. Um, especially compared to our CRISPR system. So the CRISPR system, again, the advantage here is that almost basically anybody can do it. You don't need to engineer a protein. You can perch, you can either, you know, for low cost, uh, create the uh, RNA yourself or you can purchase it. Um, there are different formats, which I'm going to go over in a few slides. Um, but essentially you get vectors that um, express both GNA and Cas GRNA and Cas9. It's highly efficient, um, and it can also uh, multiple, you can edit multiple genes um, at the same time. So really one of the, the greatest features of this technology is it's made gene editing possible for any lab at any budget and with any expertise. Okay, so now that we've gone over some of the background of CRISPR, um, the next section will talk about how you can use CRISPR uh, reagents efficiently. Okay. So the first step to designing your uh, CRISPR exper experiments is to choose an accurate and, uh, gRNA sequence. And so this process involves a balance between on-target and off-target um, activity. So on-target activity um, has been essentially designed, there have been a, a set of scoring rules that have been designed um, by, and the, the scores that we used were designed by the Broad Institute, by John Donch. And um, we call this the rule set two. And so basically, um, these rules looked at um, how many potential mismatches there are, um, how many times a gene or a sequence appears within a protein coding region, and it scored the, GR, the sequence. And so essentially, the higher the score was, the more on-target activity you would have. So in this case, from this rule set, there was a, you could score gRNAs um, between 0 and 100. 100 meaning there is absolutely no chance for off-target effects, and it's only going to, there's 100% on-target activity. So you'll probably notice when you're designing some of these gRNAs that, you know, it's very difficult um, through this algorithm or mathematically to get a score of 100. Um, and so basically the rule of thumb is when you're designing these gRNAs, um, you want to reach as high a score as possible um, to maximize your on-target activity. And so when I talk about scoring rules, um, so the, the easiest way to design your gRNAs is through an, um, using a design tool which take into effect um, into consideration these scoring rules. And on the next slide, I'll share with you some um, information about these tools. But it's made very easy um, using these, um, all these algorithms developed by other groups. Um, and so on the same vein, again, if we want to maximize on-target activity, you also want to um, minimize off-target activity. And so there are a variety that can influence um, off-targeting. Um, one of the major um, influencers is um, mismatch number or the number of um, potential mismatches within that 20 nucleotide region. Um, it's been basically they've noted that um, Cas9 enzymes can um, basically handle up, up like three to five mismatches and they'll still bind. Um, the lower the better. Um, but basically, these have been also included, these considerations are also included in the algorithm. So when you're using a design tool and you're trying to choose which gRNA you want, the lower the score basically will mean you have a greater chance for off-target. So again, these are consider, both are considerations you want to look at when you're designing um, your gRNA. 
And so I, I only very briefly went over this topic. Obviously, there are some other considerations you can in, look into when you're looking at on-target and off-target activity. However, if you want to know more, um, we actually do have another webinar. Um, so this is available for free. You can um, download the slides. Um, and I have the website listed here. So it's a good webinar that goes over some um, considerations you can look at when you want to improve your target uh, um, on target specificity. Okay, so I mentioned that um, there are algorithms that you can use to determine which gRNA is best for your experiment. Um, so these Tool, these algorithms have been used to, for a variety of gRNA design tools. So what I have listed here is one that's publicly available on our website at GenScript. And so, again, these design tools take into consideration a few things. One, the algorithm I talked about that calculates on-target activity. Um, and then it can also scan your sequences to determine where the best gRNAs are. So it looks at your target gene sequence, it looks at where the PAM sequences are, um, and also any potential mismatches. And so um, for the tool we ho host on our site, you can enter up to 200 base pair sequence of your, target, of your target. And then when you submit it, you will see a list of gRNA design options. So again, in this case, we have, they're ordered by score, so the highest score on the top to the lowest. So again, the higher the score, the less chance of off-targeting, or the higher the on-target activity. Um, so when you are selecting these gRNAs, you would probably want to choose um, at least some of the uh, gRNAs that are listed towards the top. So again, these design tools are make it really easy to generate uh, gRNAs. Okay, so now that you have designed your gRNA sequence, um, what is the next part is figuring out what the best transfection method is for your cell type. Um, really, optimizing this part can uh, make it a lot easier for you down the road since um, vectors are, have been optimized based on these uh, transfection techniques. So there are two major transfection methods. Um, there is a non-viral transfection-based method and a viral-based. So the non-viral techniques usually include, or more commonly include, lipofection or nucleofection. Again, it depends on your cell type. Um, viral-based commonly use lentivirus or AAV-based sectors, and both are used for the delivery of all your components, so your Cas9 enzyme, your gRNA, or your donor if you're doing knock-in. So which one is best for you? Well, non-viral based methods are great for, um, it's because they're very simple. The protocol is quite straightforward. Um, and you get really high efficiency and easy to transfect cell lines. They, um, it also works really well if you're trying to insert um, or deliver larger insertion vectors for your knock and experiments. Um, however, um, as maybe you have experience with, they are not as good for harder to transfect cell lines. And so in this case, we'd really recommend if you have a pretty easy to transfect cell line, easy to handle cell line, you can probably get away with a non-viral um, transfection method. For viral-based, um, again, you know, as non-viral works best for easy to transfect cell lines, Viral base works well for difficult to transfect cell lines. Um, so for instance, you'll notice you'll get a higher delivery efficiency in both primary and non-dividing cells, um, as well as other common hosts. Um, disadvantages to this technique, um, there are limitations in size for viral packaging. Um, so it might be more difficult um, to uh, deliver these longer insertion vectors. Um, so if you're doing knock-in, um, and it's also not suitable, and in turn, it's not suitable for delivery of long donor genes. So if these don't necessarily apply, but you have a harder to work with cell, then you might consider um, one of these two uh, tech uh, delivery techniques. Okay, so at this point now, you have designed your GNA sequence, and you've also confirmed um, which delivery method you want to use. So the next question is, 
which vector system does it, do I use? Um, single vector or dual vector, and does it matter? Well, yes, it does matter. Um, so there are two options, and the first option I'm showing you here is the single vector system. Um, and so this is one of our Lenti, uh, Broad's Lenti vectors, P Lenti CRISPR V2. This is probably the most commonly used Lenti vector. Um, it includes both Cas9, um, driven by the EFS promoter, and includes the G your gRNA sequence driven by U6. So both gRNA and Cas9 are on the same vector. Um, and so for this particular system, your ratio of expression is going to be one-to-one. -one. So it's going to be equal expression levels of both um, gRNA and your Cas9. Um, so this works really well, again, if you have um, easy-to-handle cells. Um, so because it can result in low titer, it might not be ideal if you have a difficult-to-work-with cell. So for instance, if you're trying to, trans uh, trying to transfect uh, primary cells or stem cells, um, it, might be, it might not be as effective. So there's an alternative to this. So as, in, as opposed to the single vector system, Again, it's, it's nice because you only have to deliver one vector, which is easier, but in some cases that might not be appropriate. And so that's where the two vector sister comes in. So here we have um, one vector that the Lenti Guide Puro I have as an example here. So this carries the gRNA. And then you also have your Cas9 vector, so here. So gRNA, Cas9 are in two different vectors. Uh, when you use these vectors, you typically first transduce the cells with the Cas9. Um, this allows you to create a stable cell pool, and then you can deliver the gRNA. Um, so it's a lot easier to use, um, or it can be more effective and difficult to work with cells. And it's also ideal if you don't want a one-to-one -one ratio of expression, or if you want to control the expression ratio. So again, it really depends on what your cell type is um, and what your end goals are. OK, so another consideration is the type of Cas9 you want to work with. So there have been multiple Cas9 derivatives that have been adapted for use in gene editing. Um, I've listed three of the most commonly used here. So up to this point, we've mentioned uh, what I've been referring to mostly is the wild type SP Cas9. So this Cas9 enzyme was first um, discovered or originated from S pyogenes. Um, it recognizes a three nucleotide PAM sequence, which is NGG, and the this particular enzyme is ideal um, because in certain cases. One, because NGG, since it's a smaller PAM sequence, it's more ubiquitous. So you'll probably see it multiple times within your target region, which means you can design more variations of gRNAs. However, if you have more, more uh, in, um, if you see NG appear more often, then there's also the likelihood that you could get more off-targeting. Um, so if you're really worried about off-target effects um, for your particular uh, editing experiment, maybe SPCAS9 isn't really for you. It's really best if you're not as concerned about off-targeting and you want to really maximize the number of gRNAs or potential knockouts you can get. So the next option is um, NICASE, or SPCAS9 D10A. So NICASE has been, is essentially a mutant of SPCAS9. And so it's been adapted so that it actually, instead of creating a double strand break, it creates NICs, or single strand breaks. And so because you need two um, Cas9 vectors, essentially because you need to NIC either side of your target, um, you do get increased specificity. The downside is you do need to purchase two gRNAs per gene. Um, however, if you're worried about off-targeting, um, because you're using two that recognize distinct regions of the gene, you get better on target activity. So finally, um, another option that's available is SA-Cas9. So SA-Cas9 is a variant that's been discovered in, uh, uh, in Staphylococcus aureus. And so you'll notice here that the PAM sequencer S4 
for SA Cas9 is different. It's longer. It's N N G R R T. And so when you're designing uh, gRNAs using it for SA Cas9, again, it's going to scan your target sequence. It's going to try and find very um, um, indices of and in this particular PAM. And so you're probably going to get fewer gRNAs just because it's a longer PAM. It's probably going to appear fewer times. Um, but the benefit is there's less chance of an off-target. Um, another benefit is it's a lot smaller. Um, so the, the SA Cas9 is smaller than SP Cas9. So if you're doing in vivo gene editing or if you need to package into AAV vectors, um, this particular Cas9 variant is ideal. So that's something to consider. All right, so I've included here just a slide, sort of a summary for how you, can, you would use gRNA constructs. Again, the first step is selecting your gRNAs. So we always, especially if you're doing for this for this first time, we recommend that you choose about three to five gRNAs per gene. Um, this is going to ensure that you have a gRNA that you know is going to target. Um, as you become more familiar with it, you can, you know, decrease the gRNA number um, in the future. But to start, always try and go a few more just to make sure um, you pick the right one. You're going to select your gRNA and Cas9 vector. Um, you'll also need to prep the constructs. Um, so, for instance, if um, they are lenty constructs, you'll need to first package them into lentivirus. Um, you might also need to do some downstream um, maxi prep, you know, if you need more, more quantity. Maybe you need transfection grade, plasmid forms, um, if you're doing non-viral. So prep them as required for your application. And then after you deliver your construct to the cells, then you can confirm transfection efficiency. And this is done by fluorescence or antibiotic selection. Um, so what I forgot to mention earlier on is that each of the vectors actually include a marker. So it can be either for fluorescence, usually it's GFP or RFP, um, or antibiotics. Um, so you can use either of these method methods to confirm the transfection was effective. OK. so. DNA plasmid, DNA plasmids, which I talked about in the earlier part of the, the uh, webinar, are still the most commonly used, um, and they work generally quite well. Um, however, since they're, um, since then, of course, CRISPR continues to evolve, and so have the um, alternatives to DNA plasmids. Um, so the alternative that I'm going to talk about here are ribonucleoproteins. Um, so essentially, these consist of a gRNA oligo and a Cas9 protein that are delivered together um, to target your specific gene. So I pulled this uh, figure actually from AdGene, which is a really good resource as well if you're interested in CRISPR. And you'll notice that whenever you do DNA-based editing, so you're going to need to deliver your vectors to the cell. Um, you're dependent on the cell's machinery to transcribe and translate um, the complex, and then you get, um, then it can target your gene. However, you'll notice, so if we deliver at, from the beginning the uh, gRNA and Cas9 complex, Cas9 protein complex into the cell, it's it, um, immediately translocated into the nucleus, and then it starts editing right away. Um, so this is a big advantage in terms of uh, efficiency, RMP has a lot of advantages. So let's look at the RMP system in a little more detail. Um, so there are three major components to the RMP system. The first is the CRISPR RNA, which we've talked about already. It's that 20 nucleotide oligo that complements your target DNA. Um, so it's this purple strand here. Um, you also need a tracer RNA sequence. So this is a conserved sequence, again, that helps guide the Cas9 protein to where it needs to go. And then, of course, you also need your Cas9 endonuclease. Um, the difference here is that, again, you're using the Cas9 protein and not the, um, not the DNA vector. Um, the CRISPR RNA sequence which is that 20 nucleotide oligo, is designed based on the same standard gRNA design principles you'd use if you're designing a gRNA that goes into a vector. So it's really easy to design. 
um, this complex is then in vitro transcribed, you combine it with the Cas9 protein, and then you can deliver it to your cells using standard protocols. So basically, whatever protocol you would use to deliver plasmid, you would use to deliver the RNP. Um, so are there many advantages of using the RNP system for gene editing? Um, at GenScript here, one of the main advantages is we provide the synthetic CRISPR RNA tracer RNA oligo, um, and we pre-duplex it for you. So you don't need to worry about in vitro transcription or any DNA syn or RNA synthesis. It's highly efficient and even in hard to transect cells. Um, actually, they demonstrated um, good efficiency in, in pluripotent stem cells. So if this is something you're working with, um, you might want to consider this system. Um, RNPs have also improved specificity. So again, once they're delivered into the cells and they translocate to the nucleus, they start working right away. Um, so, and then once they, once they complete editing, the cell's machinery will essentially start to degrade the complex. So you have the sh a shorter half-life, and as a result, there's less chance or less opportunity for the system to um, target anything off-target or create any off-target cuts. So again, if you're worried about off-targeting, this might be another option. And then finally, um, RNPs are DNA-free, and they're less toxic to cells, so they're ideal for in vivo editing. And you also don't have to worry as much about insertional mutagenesis, which is a concern when you're working with uh, plasma DNA. Okay, so now that we've talked about CRISPR reagents, I did want to talk a little bit about um, some other uh, other ways you can use CRISPR in high throughput screening. So um, since CRISPR is so easy to work with and since the cost of gene synthesis is so much lower than protein, um, libraries of gRNAs have actually been developed for, developed for high throughput screen app applications. Um, these CRISPR libraries can either mutate, activate, or repress every gene in the genome at the same time. So this is ideal for large-scale screening when you want to find important genes to, to study um, in more detail downstream. Um, so they're also a good alternative to um, shRNA-based screens, which are prone to off-targeting and false negatives. Um, so I have a, a little animation or a little picture here just to give you an overview of how the libraries are used. So um, there are a couple alternatives. You can either purchase libraries which have already been designed, and they've been designed to target every gene in the genome, or you can design the sequences yourself and then package them as well, either way. So essentially you're targeting every gene. Um, typically you need to amplify these constructs. Um, 25 micrograms is typically the working range um, for these libraries. Um, and then after you amplify them, um, you'll need to do sequencing, usually by next gen, um, just to confirm that you still have representation of every GRD sequence, or almost every. And then finally, you'll package vectors into lentivirus um, and then deliver them to your cells. So there are three main types of gRNA libraries that have been developed to date. Um, the first and probably the most commonly used is the genome-wide knockout library. So these uh, libraries contain gRNAs that target every gene in the genome, and when they're transfected into your cell pool, they create frame shift mutations at very high frequencies. And then essentially, again, you um, end up with a high frequency loss of function mutation. The second type of library doesn't actually create permanent modifications to the genome. Instead, it actually modifies the expression of every gene in the cell. In this case, CRISPR activator libraries do just that. They use an inactivated Cas9 enzyme that activates gene transcription. Um, and while genome-wide knockout libraries are designed to target the coding region of the gene, um, gRNAs in this library are designed to target regions upstream of the transcription start, start site um, about minus 400 to minus 50 base pairs upstream. And then finally, the third type of library um, also doesn't actually edit the genome, but instead acts to inhibit gene transcription. 
or gene um, expression. And these libraries also target upstream from the transcription start site, usually about minus 50 to plus 300 base pairs relative um, to the target. So we briefly mentioned early on um, about how CRISPR libraries are used, but here I want to give a little more overview on the process. Um, so there are a couple options for acquiring CRISPR libraries. Again, you can either design them or you can purchase them. Um, and I'll mention some of the details about that, I think, in the next few slides. Um, these libraries are typically delivered in, uh, cloned into vectors. And from this point, they can either be amplified if you need more quantity, or they can be packaged into lentiviral vectors and applied to your cell pool. I mean, when you apply the library, um, it's important to um, pay attention to your MOI. So again, you want to ensure that basically you get a single gRNA represented and in, in, transfected into each cell. Um, so we usually use an MOI of about 0.3, um, but you might want to tailor this specifically to your experiment. Um, and then after, so after you apply the viral library, then you actually perform the screen. Um, so there's two main uh, screening types. It really depends on what your goals are. Um, both positive and negative screens are commonly used. Um, and then you can essentially assess the results um, with next-gen sequencing. So for instance, for positive screens, you can compare test and control cells to identify cells that pass a specific selection mechanism, like say exposure to a specific chemical or drug. Or alternatively, you can look at cells that don't survive a specific selection, um, or cells that die. Um, so really, regardless of the method used, um, these particular experiments and these particular libraries can provide a lot of information about your specific application. So here I have listed some of the um, libraries that we provide. Um, so again, all of our reagents are road validated, meaning they've basically been created and we can supply them from uh, Fang Zhang's group. The, uh, our genome-wide library, or genome scale knockout library, is Gecko V2. Um, so this is, uh, will knock out all known coding regions for loss of function screening. Um, if you want to know more about it, I have the reference listed here, and they talk about how they created these libraries. Another option is the SAM library. So if you want to activate every gene in your genome, you can use this library. So this is known to activate all known coding regions by gain of, for gain-of-function screening. Again, um, the reference is listed here. So finally, if you want to do a higher throughput screen, but you don't need to target every single gene in the genome, sometimes this can be overkill, you can think about using pathway-focused libraries. So these are sets of gRNAs within a common pathway or with a common focus. Um, and so basically, you can look at those that are only important for your application. Um, so this is, again, a pooled library. These are all pooled libraries. Um, but if, if high throughput screening is something you'd like to do, these can be great options, and they're a lot cheaper than uh, many other uh, alternatives. So again, if you want to know more about CRISPR libraries, um, again, we, do, we actually have yet another webinar that we talk more about this. Um, so I have the, web, the webinar is called uh, CRISPR GRNA Libraries, Design Options Applications, and How They Can Accelerate Your Genetic Screening Studies. Again, you can find all these um, webinars at the website listed here, um, genscript.com backslash CRISPR webinars. And there's a lot of more good information about libraries in that webinar. Okay, so now that we've gone through the different types of options, I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking about how um, the CRISPR has been used to edit mammalian cell lines. So here I have a general workflow for if you are preparing for mammalian cell line projects. So there are, essentially there are five main steps, and these are what I have listed here. So we've spent a lot of, we've spent some time discussing the first step, designing your gRNAs to target your, tar to target your gene and clone them into vectors, package them as appropriately and deliver to cells. Um, and I also mentioned um, enrichment of your transfected cells by facts or antibiotics. Um, again, efficiency really depends on both your cell type and how you deliver your constructs. Um, so by enriching 
your pool, you can ensure that you end up with a population that has included, has only been transfected. We actually most commonly use facts here at GenScript. This is a pretty easy way to sort, um, but you can use antibiotics if your constructs include antibiotic resistance markers. So after you've enriched your pool, you can isolate single-celled clones and then plate them. Um, usually we plate, try, you know, plate about one cell per, 90, per well in a 96-fold plate. And then we allow them to allow the cells to grow from single-cell clones. Um, and then you can check your editing efficiency by sequencing. So one common application, again, uh, for CRISPR uh, cell lines is to knock out a protein coding gene. So here I just have a, a quick overview of the process. Um, so again, the first step would be to design the GRNAs to target your protein coding region. Um, when you're designing these GRNAs, one consideration you might think about is what part of the coding region you target. So like if you target, target like the C terminus, um, you know, you're probably gonna, it probably won't work as well. You're going to get ex mostly expression of your, your protein. Um, so in that case, you want, might want to think about which particular exons you want to target um, just to maximize the chance that you're going to actually knock out functionally your protein. So after you've designed your gRNAs, you'll then isolate the knockout clones and sequence them. Um, here I have an example where we did a KRAS um, knockout in the HGT116 um, cells. So here we can see the region of the knockout. And then sequencing can further confirm a frame shift mutation um, showing um, destruction of the protein coding region. And again, it's always a good idea um, to not rely solely on sequencing, but to follow up with other functional assays, for instance, by Western blot that I have here. Um, growth assays are another um, popular uh, follow-up as well. So generation of knock-in is another, um, another popular choice. Um, so in this case, you would design a donor template for HDR, um, and you can either deliver it in plasmids, or again, you can design it as an oligo. Um, typically, the plasma donor should have two homologous arms on either side of the, of the gene, exogenous gene, about 0.5 to 1 kilobase in length, um, flanking your desired um, insertion or mutation. And to assist in detecting su successful HDR and quantifying knock and efficiency, um, the donor templates are often designed to have some type um, or include several synonymous mutations. And then finally, to prevent the cleavage of donor templates or of the genomic DNA after successful HDR, um, the donor template should also be designed with mutations on the PAM sequence. So again, these are options if you're looking, want to do knock-in. Okay, so as an example here, I have a case study um, where we use CRISPR to knock out an enzyme in uh, CHO cell lines. So CHO cell lines are workhorses for bioproduction. Um, and in this example, um, we wanted to knock out an enzyme uh, called glutamine synthetase. So this um, is an enzyme that en enables de novo glutamine um, production. Um, however, it can interfere for in protein production applications, um, or it can impede um, selection of positively transfected cells. Um, and so knocking it out will makes it a lot more effective for industrial purposes. And then so in this example, we transfected um, CHO cells with gRNAs targeting this GS allele, glutamine synthetase allele. We selected clones for Sanger sequencing. And then we also looked at downstream assays so we could show that, um, again, by Western blot, we don't see any glutamine synthetase uh, expression. And then we also were able to show that with, in cells that don't have glutamine synthesis, synthetase, they would only grow in the presence of L-glutamine. So again, CRISPR is, has been shown to be very effective for multiple applications. So another uh, case I wanted to mention um, is a stable cell pool. So if you have a cell that's really difficult to work with, or you say it does not cult grow well from a single cell, um, so it's difficult to um, obtain single cell clones. You might want to consider a stable, uh, a knockout cell pool. 
And so essentially, this is a pool of cells that are, have stable, stably expressed Cas9 and gRNA. Um, and in this example, um, we designed gRNAs to target the DNA JC, uh, JC3 gene. So this is a heat shock protein, uh, encodes a heat shock protein. And by proof of concept, basically, we're able to show um, that you can look at a pool, and you'll see that there's a certain population of cells where you get nucleotide mismatching. And then you can further look at the, um, using sequencing trace analysis, look at the indel mutation rate, and you'll see that in this particular example, almost 90% of the cells um, that we transfected were uh, knocked out or carried that indel. This mutation rate can vary greatly, really depending on your cell type. But again, if you have difficult to handle cells and you want to use CRISPR, this might be um, a good option for you. Okay, so that kind of wraps up the main content of this webinar. Um, I did want to just go over some of the services we offer here. Um, so we offer a variety of CRISPR plasmids and all the variations that I mentioned earlier. Um, we also offer RNP, so we offer synthetic CRISPR RNA and Cas9 protein. It's pre-designed or customized, um, so again, depending on, on what your needs are. We also offer uh, gRNA libraries, um, as well as mammalian cell line services. So if you're interested in any of these, uh, any of the services or products that I mentioned today, you can go to our website and find them there. And then finally, I wanted to wrap up by mentioning some other resources um, that we have. So if you have some more questions about CRISPR, um, want to go over some of the content we mentioned here, uh, we also have a CRISPR handbook. So this includes um, useful workflows, protocols, and backgrounds. Um, we have, I mentioned a few, but we have multiple free webinars you can look at. These are available to download um, at your leisure, and you can feel free to watch those. And again, we also, if you want, or if you're interested in gRNA design, have a variety of design tools and databases, as well as other um, FAQ sections. And so you can access these by going to our, uh, the website listed here. All right, so that concludes our webinar today. Um, I hope that this was helpful to you. Um, we will now take this time to answer any questions you might have. Um, also, again, I'm including the website here that will give you some more information on our services and, and other questions, or I have my email here as well. Please feel free to, you know, email me with any questions you might have, um, and we can, we can help you out. But anyway, yeah, so if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the questions um, dash on your questions section of the web go to webinar screen. All right, so one question that um, comes up a lot that I'll just address is the longest gene you can actually knock out. Um, so this is actually a really good question. Um, so in-house, we have been able to knock out up to 100, uh, a, a, a section up to 100 kilobases. Um, again, the longer the section that you're trying to knock out, the lower the efficiency. Um, so that's just a consideration, but generally the smaller the region, um, the more efficient. All right, so I have another question here about um, our gecko libraries and the different types of gecko libraries. So, I um, mean, yeah, I didn't really mention this in this uh, webinar. Um, the gRNA library webinar will have a lot more information if you want to check it out. But there are different types of genome-wide libraries, um, specifically for the gecko system. So there's um, A and B. Um, so essentially, both libraries target the same genes. Um, the, ex the exception is um, A and B have different gRNAs. Um, so library A uh, also includes gRNAs. Um, library A can include gRNAs that target um, microRNAs, um, and the B library does not contain those gRNAs. So if you combine everything together, you have about six gRNAs per gene. Um, however, the difficulty with using both A and B libraries simultaneously is you need a lot of cells 
in order for them to work. Um, and because you'll want a low MOI. So if you're worried about cell concentration, um, then you can, I would recommend using um, Library A. Okay, so I have another question here. Um, so if I were to knock out several genes from bacteria, specifically Salmonella, should I use a viral vector or a non-viral one? So this is a really good question. Um, so I should specify that um, these vectors are optimized for eukaryotic cells, the ones that I mentioned here. Um, in ter if you want to look at bacteria, um, I would, I guess, I don't, have, I don't have the immediate answer to your question. You might have to try both um, to see which one works best for your system. But you know what, I can get back to you and see if I can um, get some of that information. Because it might, it does, I know CRISPR, using CRISPR for editing of um, um, the, for editing of uh, prokaryotes um, is different depending on which one, which strain you're looking at. Um, but it's most likely going to be um, non-viral. But we can get, I can get you some more information on that and see if we know offhand. Okay, so the next question is, which vector, if any, would you recommend for genome editing in vivo? Um, so I would probably recommend, usually for, a, for in vivo editing, we recommend the AAV vectors. Um, just because they're smaller, they might be easier to deliver. So if you're doing injection, um, that's, those are the most common. Um, so I would probably start with the uh, AAV vector system. Um, however, you might find, um, you know, depending on what you're working with, some if other people have done similar experiments, you can always check and see um, what the current data is. But yeah, AEV vectors are great if you're doing in vivo because of their smaller size and they're really easy to package. All right. Um, well, I think um, we're actually running out of time, and I don't have any more questions. Um, so if anyone has any more, you didn't have a chance to ask or couldn't think of them yet, um, please feel free to email me. And oh, just kidding. What, so we have one more question. What system do you recommend for primary fibroblasts? Um, so that's also really good. You'd probably, these are typically harder to work with. I'd probably try the, VAR, the Lenti system first. Um, since, yeah, primary cell lines can be a lot more finicky and as opposed to stable, um, stable cell lines. Um, so I would first try with a Lenti system. Um, it's possible non-viral will work. You may need to optimize it, um, but that might, I would probably start, yeah, I'd probably start with viral. Okay, I think, yeah, when, um, okay, and the next question is, um, what system do you recommend for immortalized cells? You know, again, this really depends on your cell type. Um, so we, it depends on how, uh, I would say, how easy your cells are to work with. Um, so, or immortal, okay, so the question has been, uh, is for, does the system recommended for primary immortalized fibroblasts. I'd still probably say um, you would probably have to try it out, try out both. Um, if, it's a, if it's a cell line that's more difficult to handle, again, we'd probably recommend a viral-based approach. Um, so that's how I would probably start. Um, but again, you might need to optimize it specifically uh, for your cell line. Um, but I think for in general fibroblasts, I'd probably start with um, Lenti first. Okay, I have a couple more questions. Great. So the next question is, what system would you recommend for a yeast cell line? Um, this is a great question, and I didn't talk about our microbial services here. So we actually do have a separate system for yeast cells. Again, the, the um, products that I mentioned here are designed specifically for, um, for eukaryotic or for mammalian cell lines. 
For yeast cells, it's a little bit different, but we, you can still use a CRISPR system. Um, what I can do is actually get back to you with some more details about, um, about the types of vectors. We don't actually sell the vectors individually, but we do provide a service for yeast cells, so we can give you some more information there. But it is going to be, the vector's format is a little bit different from the ones that I've been describing today. Um, okay, are there two tools for designing the donor DNA? Um, well, sure. So I guess if you, it depends on what your target is, and we can actually probably work with you if you have specific questions on design. Um, but essentially what we would do is um, you kind of you look based on what your target is or, you know, what, is, what are you trying to knock in, for instance. So we can help you uh, synthesize that donor DNA. Um, and then we would recommend cloning that into usually a standard a cloning vector should work okay. Um, but if you do have specific questions on how to design that, that's something we'd be happy to work with you on. But essentially that's... Um, really depends on what you're trying to insert, what sequence you want to insert. All right. Um, so it looks like that is the end of the questions, unless someone has um, any more. Um, for those who, again, uh, didn't have a chance to ask, please feel free to email me and we can always help you out. Um, but otherwise, um, thank you so much for attending. I really hope this was useful. Um, you will be uh, receiving a copy of the webinar. Um, you'll receive a link um, after this um, so you can um, watch it again. Uh, but again, thank you so much and have a great day and best of luck with your research.